Okay, so this is um, antibodies part two. Um, I was talking about the heavy chains and the light chains of an antibody. And now we're going to talk about two different regions of an antibody. Um, many times so far in the class now we've talked about the specificity that's important. So in order for an antibody to bind to something, it has to match it right here in this region. And we call this the variable region. It's sort of like the puzzle piece has to fit or it won't bind to a pathogen or a part of a pathogen. So this is the variable region and it only recognizes one antigen. Okay, and then the constant region here is called constant because it's going to be the same for all antibodies of that type like IgM or IgE. So the constant region is the same for all antibodies of a certain class. So, um, for example, there's IgA, IgG, and IgE antibodies, also IgM. So, what usually happens is in the primary exposure, mostly the plasma cells make IgM antibodies. However, that stimulation by T cells um, can sp specifically um, indicate to a plasma cell what kind of antibodies it should ultimately be making. So just to get the ball rolling, the, the plasma cells all ready to go by producing IgM antibodies that have this variable region that matches whatever the particular pathogen of the day is. But then gradually over the course of that exposure and definitely in future exposures, a class switch will occur. And that means that this part of the antibody will now be different too. So the constant region either is IgM, IgG, IgGA, or IgE. There's also IgD, but we don't talk too much about that one. So the first um, popular kind of antibody that I'll talk about are IgA. So these an antibodies, IgA, um, are particularly good at preventing pathogens from adhering to mucous membranes or breaching through them. So for that reason, they're very concentrated on mucous membranes. This is a common place that we find them. They do circulate in the blood though, and that's how um, they are also plentiful in breast milk because the blood is filtered to make nutritious uh, milk for the newborn. And in this sense, they are then, when the baby ingests them, then they coat the baby's intestines and help to prevent the baby from getting um, pathogens, especially like diarrheal or um, respiratory infections. It's protecting their mucous membranes. And if you remember what some examples are of mucous membranes, there's the GI tract, the respiratory tract, the urinary tract, and the reproductive tract. So IgA antibodies are important in all of those locations. Now some pathogens 
will make a protease that can chop up our IgA. So for example, uh, Neisseria can do that. So it's kind of like, you know, warfare. The, the host comes up with these IgA antibodies and then the pathogen comes up with these proteases that will chop up IgA antibodies. So for example, Neisseria, Neisseria gonorrhea can cause gonorrhea and Neisseria meningitidis can cause uh, respiratory and um, of course meningitis, respiratory infections as well. So that's the first kind. Okay, next let's talk about IgG antibodies. Whoop, got blurry on me, didn't it? Come on. There. So IgG antibodies um, are uh, sort of the most common kind of antibody you would find circulating in the blood. And um, they're also plentiful in breast milk. And interestingly, they're able to cross the placenta in a pregnant woman to affect her unborn child. This can be good if um, the mother is immune to something, then her baby will be protected from it. But this could be bad if the mom's own antibodies for some reason attack some part of the developing baby. So this could be good to protect the baby from diseases, bad in the case the mother's antibodies attacking the unborn baby. So if someone were going to ask you, what's the most common kind of antibody in the body? You um, could probably say IgG and, you know, be correct most of the time. Okay, and then IgE is the third kind of antibody I'd like to talk to you about. Remember, the first time you're exposed to something, if the B cells are stimulated to make antibodies, they're going to make IgM. This class switch is something that comes along as the um, B cell is, um, the memory cells are becoming more and more effective at sp specifically taking out whatever pathogen it is. And what we find is that IgE antibodies tend to be found um, protecting against definitely extracellular pathogens, and in fact, they seem to be. Um, protecting against helminths and protists in particular. But definitely extracellular pathogens, as opposed to IgG, which um, might be able to um, go after pathogens that um, are intracellular. So with IgE, most of the attention it gets is bad. It's elevated in allergies. So people with chronic allergies will tend to have abnormally high levels of IgE antibodies. And one theory is that, um, that uh, it untrained B cells may uh, respond inappropriately. And all I mean by that is that there is a theory out there that if um, a child is exposed to helminths, helminths as a child and protist infections and things like that, then they're in theory not going to be inappropriately producing IgE antibodies, which we do find associated with allergies. 
and it does seem to also be true that um, a history of worm infections is inversely related to allergies. I think this is an area though that we're going to be learning a lot more about in years to come. So one interesting about IgE antibodies is they act back to stimulate further inflammation. And so you can see if they are inappropriately stimulated now, they're going to be causing inflammation and that can give um, uncomfortable symptoms in allergies and asthma. So they're going to stimulate a couple of different kinds of cells. Let's see if you can remember these. They both have bilobed nucleuses and one has red granules and the other has purple granules and they are eosinophils and basophils. So these were both part of the innate immune system but are now stimulated further in adaptive immunity, antibody mediated. So that's going to enhance, or sorry, enhance inflammation. And um, there are different kinds of helper T cells. IgE antibodies are more likely produced by B cells that were stimulated by Th2 T cells. So Th2 cells um, are more likely to Okay, so what I mean by that is if a Th1 cell stimulates a B cell to make antibodies, it's more likely to make IgG or IgA. If a Th2 cell stimulates a B cell to make antibodies, now in that case we're having more IgE. And that's why we find in allergenic profiles that they sometimes have an imbalance of Th2 activity to Th1.